now we're going to talk about the pneumothorax. There's three types we're going to talk about, the spontaneous pneumothorax and the, sec the secondary spontaneous pneumothorax and also the tension pneumothorax. First off, we'll do a case with questions here. You've got a young person who comes into the ER and he's got some mild shortness of breath, but it's not that bad. He's not using his accessory muscles to breathe. He doesn't look that short of breath to you. And he's got some some left-sided chest pain, and that's really why he came in, because when he takes a deep breath, his chest hurts. We call that pleuritic chest pain. And, you know, in this patient, given the demographics, he's a smoker, uh, what's the most likely diagnosis? And we could have a spontaneous pneumothorax, or secondary spontaneous, or PE, or pneumonia. And in this case, as you probably remember, someone who's young, tall, has a marfanoid habitus, this is going to be a spontaneous pneumothorax. And one thing to point out is that the vignette looks similar to a PE, but again, read the rest of the question. This person doesn't have risk factors for a PE, and he's tall, and he smokes, and again, probably has Marfan syndrome on the test anyway. Um, and again, I think it's important to know that despite the fact they have essentially a ruptured lung or a pneumothorax, their symptoms are pretty mild here because they have enough oxygen or you know reserve capacity in their lung to handle this. If you suspect this based on exam, you should order a chest x-ray. So after you order a chest x-ray, you can use the chest x-ray to see how large the pneumothorax is. So they have to tell you about how much space is in between the pleural lining and the chest wall. And if it's a small pneumothorax, then, then you can actually give supported treatment with oxygen and observe them for six hours before doing the chest x-ray again. The idea here is that if you give this person oxygen, it's going to reduce or completely relieve their shortness of breath, allow their lung to re-expand, and in a few hours, they won't have any symptoms. A lot of these people may not even come in for evaluation because it's really a pretty mild uh, disease. But if the pneumothorax is a little larger, we'll say greater than three centimeters, but more importantly on the shelf, if they're having symptoms, despite you giving them oxygen, that's somebody who's going to need to have a needle thoracentesis. And this is different than the thoracentesis you do for a pleural effusion. What you're going to do here is insert the needle where they have the free air, or where the pneumothorax was, and it's essentially just going to aspirate air out of the lung in order to help the lung re-expand faster. But again, you're only going to do that if they're still having symptoms despite oxygen. And note on here that we're not going to give these people a chest tube. That's too much because this is a pretty mild illness. But, um, let's see here. If somebody has a vignette like this and in the question stem it says that they're here for the third or fourth time, that's somebody who you might want to consider referring for surgery. The surgery for this would be what we call a pleurodesis. It's called, you know, it's again, it's video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. It's done by a thoracic surgeon, and they just go in there, and they essentially just irritate the pleura, you know, sort of cauterize it almost, and it sort of reseals it up. So just know that pleurodesis is a treatment that you can do with COPD. Somebody comes in, and you know they have COPD, and they have got profound shortness of breath. They're using their accessory muscles, and they look really, really sick to you. And, um, the problem here is when a COPD person has a pneumothorax, they don't have the lung reserve like a healthy young person does to compensate for that loss of lung mass. So they get extremely short of breath. And when you're thinking about how to manage these people, they actually they actually need to be admitted. And um, did I put that on here right? Um, yeah. So they actually need to be admitted and you also have to put in a chest tube. You can't just do a needle aspiration for somebody who has uh, COPD. Their lung disease is too severe and they're gonna need probably prolonged uh, removal of air from that lung because the, those blubs are gonna keep releasing air if they have a pneumothorax. So I just wanna point out to you, the treatment here is gonna be to admit them to the hospital and to put in an actual chest tube. And again, the, the actual f terminology for a chest tube is a uh, thoracostomy. So how do we manage the secondary pneumothorax? Again, much more severe symptoms. 
and know that it's associated with rupture of the apical blebs. And doing a needle thoracentesis again, not adequate treatment. It, you know, you can do it for a spontaneous one, but not for a, a, a COPD associated pneumothorax. And there's the name for the chest tube. So you have that and you know that. Um, and so the big thing here to be aware of is that somebody who has COPD, if they have one pneumothorax, it's pretty likely they'll have another. So this is someone that you're going to want to refer for surgery to have a pleurodesis done to reseal up that pleura and prevent this from happening again. Because somebody, especially after putting a chest tube in, it's very likely that these patients, I think the, the statistic I read was greater than 60 or 70% of these people return with new uh, recurrent pneumothoraces. So if they ask you what can you do to prevent this from happening again, or what should the definitive treatment be for this uh, pneumothorax in a COPD patient, the answer is going to be to do thoracoscopic surgery and do a pleurodesis. So I want you to make sure you know uh, how and where you insert a chest tube. Know that it's between the fifth and sixth rib and the fifth intercostal space. It could also be in the fourth intercostal space. That shouldn't be what they ask you. Again, make sure you know you're going in above the lower rib. And the key here will be that you insert it in the mid axillary line. So that's basically under the armpit, which is different from where we put in the thoracentesis needle uh, for the effusion. You put that in in the mid clavicular line from the back, and this is going to be in the armpit area. So now let's say you have a patient who comes in and their exam suggests to you that they may have a you know pneumothorax because you don't hear any lung sounds. Um, but this person is also extremely hypotensive. They're exhibiting signs that make you think they might be in shock and their history further on tells you that they have penetrating chest trauma. So this is someone who probably has a tension pneumothorax and what should we do uh, to manage this? At least, and this is an emergency. This person is going to die imminently if we don't do something very quickly. So um, should you order a chest x-ray or should you just go ahead and put a chest tube in? So I'll tell you, you want to go ahead in a situation like this, you put the chest tube in, you do not, you do not need an x-ray. This is a clinical diagnosis. We have diagnosed a spontaneous pneumothorax. This patient's in a dire situation. We're going to put the chest tube in and we'll get the x-ray afterwards to make sure it's in the right spot. The only reason you do a chest tube here is, it, or I'm sorry, an x-ray is if you're not sure what's going on um, and you think it might be like a, you know, not this, but so here are some classic presentations of attention pneumothorax. Uh, when you're reading a vignette, if you see these different scenarios, you should suspect that the diagnosis will be attention pneumothorax. One of the most classic ones is somebody who's on a mechanical ventilator or an ARDS patient who started to improve and then rapidly decompensated. And the key there would be to see some hypotension, but also a loss of breath sounds. Uh, anyone with penetrating chest trauma uh, on the shelf, I'd say that's a tension pneumothorax um, until proven otherwise. And if you're reading a vignette and they're talking about someone putting in a central line, and then while they're putting in the central line, the patient gets short of breath and starts to code and go into shock, that's going to be a tension pneumothorax. And if you have somebody who you thought had a simple benign pneumothorax, but they start to acutely worsen and become hypotensive, again, that should be a tension pneumothorax. So my point would be here, anytime you're reading a vignette and you think it sounds and looks like a pneumothorax and you see the blood pressure is below 100 systolic, it's a tension pneumothorax, we're done. Um, and again, the pathophysiology here is going to be the one-way valve allowing air to build up and compress the heart and the lungs. It prevents the cardiac output from getting out of the heart. And it actually prevents blood from getting in the heart because it causes increased uh, central venous pressure. Um, and again, I want to reiterate this. This is going to be on your medicine and your surgery shelf. Put the chest tube in immediately. You do it before you put uh, you do the chest x-ray. Um, and you do not intubate these patients because if you intubate them, you're just going to keep breathing and you're going to keep you know, exacerbating that one-way valve system and worsen them even more. Um, and 
one thing that I should have already mentioned is that when you are in an emergency situation, it takes a few minutes to put a chest tube in. So before or, or while somebody is putting the chest tube in, the person at the head of the bed is going to perform a needle decompression where they put the needle, it's going to be just a small needle into that anterior midclavicular line, probably in the second intercostal space, sort of right above the nipple there. And they're going to puncture um, the pleura and allow some air to get out and just to buy some time while the person is putting in the chest tube. 